unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. If you've watched primetime television in India at any point in the last two decades, there is zero chance that you are not acquainted with our guest on the show today. Since 1999, the journalist Nidhi Razdan has been reporting on the biggest news coming out of India, from politics to the economy, and especially foreign affairs. A stalwart presence night after night on NDTV, one of India's leading news outlets, Nidhi was the executive editor of the channel and the primary anchor of their primetime news show, Left, Right, and Center. In June 2020, Nidhi announced that she was taking a break from reporting journalism in order to teach journalism. She is currently an associate professor of journalism at Harvard, and I'm pleased to welcome her to the show for the very first time. Nidhi, it's so good to talk to you. Thanks very much for having me on, Milan. Thanks very much. So I want to start by asking you a little bit about your own personal trajectory. You know, for many years now, you have been... I think it's fair to say one of the most popular, most recognizable faces of Indian television journalism reporting, you know, day in and day out from the kind of familiar NDTV studios that we all become accustomed to. At the start of the summer, however, you announced, and I think it surprised a lot of people, that you would be stepping down from NDTV to assume a new teaching position at Harvard. What prompted you to kind of take this plunge uh, and make this kind of career switch? Maybe it's a middle-age crisis. I don't know. But but on a serious note, actually, uh, the opportunity sort of came my way. Uh, it wasn't something that I was actively seeking. But when the opportunity did present itself before me late last year, I just felt uh, that you know it was it was an opportunity of a lifetime. It was an it was a chance to do something uh, I love, but in a completely different way, which is which is news and which is journalism related. It was a chance for me to uh, to try something new at this point in my life because all I have done since I've been twenty one years old was to do. Uh, journalism and and I've been on television day after day reporting from the field, being in the studio, and I think this just gave me an opportunity, Milan, to take a step back and challenge myself in a different way. And I'm really really glad that I I took that decision because I felt that if I didn't take a risk now and try something new, then I'd never do it. And why not? Right. I mean, I know that uh, things haven't totally worked out the way you'd imagine because of COVID, uh, that, that you're not in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, teaching um, teaching in person. But can you tell us a little bit? I think classes start next week. What, what are you going to be teaching? And how, 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 what's your kind of mental uh, state right now? So uh, we will be starting classes in a few weeks, Milan, and uh, I'm going to be interesting subjects and all related to what I have done over the last couple of decades, which is basically how to report on foreign policy, on policy, on foreign affairs, particularly focusing on on television, uh, looking at another subject on the ethics of journalism. Also later in the year, uh, video uh, journalism in particular, how to edit stories, how to write for TV, uh, politics in particular in in a further future quarter. So yes, I mean, right now we will be online. So I will be doing that from Delhi. And then that of course, is not a, not what we had uh, had anticipated. But uh, I think the university is hoping that at some point uh, we will be on campus early next year. Um, maybe not with a full strength class. I don't know that yet. But I I hope I do make my way to Cambridge uh, early next year, and I look forward to that. And you know, I like this too. I mean, you know, we, we're all having to deal with a very challenging environment. All of us. It's not just peculiar to to me. And uh, I'm going to make the best of it. I want to take us back a little bit to the start of your career. Um, you started in NDTV, I think, in 1999. Um, so you've had two decades or so in the business of journalism. And as you kind of look back over your career to this point, um, tell us a little bit about how TV journalism in particular has changed since you were kind of a young cub reporter getting your start. You know, what was the scene like back in 1999? It was completely different. I think firstly because NDTV was really the only private news channel around. And that made a big difference in terms of competition for ratings and and getting things on air first. And and I mean, basically, that we, we were the only ones. And that made a difference because that gave us a lot of breathing space as young reporters to take time to do our stories. We would also spend a lot of time uh, doing rural reporting, 
uh, traveling out of uh, Delhi into India's hinterland, into villages. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, you take a week to, to do a good long format story or even a documentary. Over time, things began to change as more and more news channels came onto the scene, uh, competition um, heated up. And, you know, today, uh, it's, it's really sad to see the state that television is in. And NDTV remains an exception. Uh, it's the only channel that's keeping the flag of journalism flying high. And I say that with a lot of pride and, and some sadness as well. Because today, television in India has turned, television news in India has turned into, uh, well, to borrow a phrase uh, from you, a tamasha. Uh, and uh, I'm actually embarrassed to see what it's become. And I, I, it's, it's not even embarrassing anymore, Milan. It's, it's scary because, uh, you know, it's, it's like Radio Rwanda all over again what some of these news channels are doing. To back to the decline of TV journalism in a second, but before I do, you know, particularly for the uninitiated uh, listeners who might be out there, I think it's no secret to say that in some quarters in India, NDTV has been sort of something like a punching bag, you know, uh, it has a target on its back or there's that perception. Why do you think it is that it's garnered so much attention, uh, including some degree of unwanted attention from some places? Well, this, let's let's just be forthright and admit that the some places you refer to are the, the BJP government uh, and and the BJP supporters, and I think that's uh, that's a very unfair target on NDTV's back simply because they've created this perception uh, that NDTV is completely purely anti-BJP, and for some and for for them any anyone who's anti-BJP must be pro-Congress, and that's completely untrue, uh, and. Uh, it's just that, uh, Milan, you really can't compete beyond a point with the IT cells propaganda, uh, which is where you flood people's WhatsApp groups and messages and uh, Twitter timelines with a certain narrative about not just a news channel like NDTV, but individuals, individual journalists, women journalists in particular. So a sort of a narrative is sought to be created. It's, it's done with their political opponents as well. And frankly, the only problem they have with NDTV is that it reports news fairly. And they don't want news to be reported fairly. They only want people to sing their praises. They do not want questions to be asked. The job of the media is to ask the establishment questions, to ask the government of the day questions. But... Uh, today, the news channels friendly to the government ask the opposition questions. So if there is a, 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 you know, a pandemic, they're not going to ask what has the prime minister of India done about it, but they're going to ask what Rahul Gandhi has done about it. And they forget that the same NDTV was talking night after night about scams in the UPA government, the previous government, led by the Congress, which included the 2G scam, the, the Commonwealth Games scam, the coal scam. The silence of the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, was questioned night after night. But it's convenient to push that under the carpet and sort of create this narrative that somehow NDTV takes a political line. Nobody wants to see fair, honest reporting. Let's face it. And that's why, you know, NDTV gets that target. But I disagree with you on one thing. Uh, I think overwhelmingly the opinion about NDTV is positive. It's not negative. There, there is a silent majority out there, and we see that. Uh, I'm not going by the bark ratings, which are very controversial, but you go on to, to YouTube online and see the kind of hits our shows get, uh, or uh, I still say R, I'm still used to saying NDTV, as, uh, you know, even though I'm not there anymore. But, uh, you know, I think, I think you know, it, it's the only glimmer of hope in a very sort of dark media world at the moment. So, you know, I want to pick upon uh, the, that last thing you said, because I think it's absolutely true. But isn't there an irony here, which is that uh, there may be opposition from the BJP towards the channel and bad mouthing of the channel. But yet night after night, they want to appear on the channel in the debates and discussions that you yourself have posted and your colleagues have posted, because there is a recognition, isn't there, that this is an important venue in, in the same way that uh, President Trump, uh, on a daily basis, criticizes the New York Times, and at the same time, cannot get enough of talking to reporters like Maggie Haberman and others and, and, and feeding them stories. So isn't that a, an irony in all of this? Actually, it's not. It's a very schizophrenic sort of relationship that, that the ruling party has with NDTV, because uh, for the last few years, they've actually officially boycotted NDTV. So official national spokespersons of the party, the ruling party, do not appear on 
either our English uh, on, on the NDTV English channel or the Hindi channel. Right. So you have people who are members of the party who are not official uh, spokespersons or sort of their proxies, supporters. They come on the channel and uh, and the BJP officially does not. But you're right. When there is a big event, let's say, um, you know, the Swachh Bharat campaign on Gandhi Jayanti, 2nd October, Mahatma Gandhi's birth anniversary, then, you know, top ministers will come out and speak to NDTV as well. Or when there's an election, uh, many of them do come and speak out. Uh, but Prime Minister Modi has not given NDTV an interview uh, since he became Prime Minister. So that's something to think about. He's done he's done a few interviews on his terms, of course, uh, with uh, with channels, uh, other channels and journalists uh, who, you know, uh, are, are, let's say, more friendly to his dispensation. Uh, but he has not done an interview with NDTV. So it's a... It's, uh, uh, we're sort of been deliberately left out in the cold, NDTV has, you know. Amit Varma, the journalist, recently wrote a piece on the troubles with Indian television, and I just want to quote something that he wrote. He says, in the United States, channels make up uh, 70% of their revenues from subscriptions. For Indian news channels, it's 10% or less. The rest is advertising. Uh, therefore, news channels have no choice but to chase the eyeballs and to go for the lowest common denominator. Uh, do you agree with Amit that this is the primary culprit or is there something else going on that we haven't been paying attention to? I think that is the bottom line. Amit is absolutely right. And uh, the problem is, and I asked, uh, you know, somebody who sort of looks at the business side, because I've only been focusing on the editorial side all these years about why, uh, wh whether there's a better way to, to strengthen revenue for television. And, and the problem is that people still don't want to subscribe by and large uh, to to, to the news that they want to see on air. So yes, uh, television is dependent on advertising. And, uh, you know, I firmly believe that the kind of hate-filled content you see on Indian television news night after night will not stop until advertisers also take a stand and say that we're not going to fund hate. We've seen some examples of that in the United States. And I don't see why, uh, you know, advertisers here you know, can't grow a conscience and say, no, we're not going to do it. I've seen many of them complain in, in private during, uh, you know, seminars and, and, and conferences. I, I got up in one of those a couple of years ago and said, but you, you, you're you the sponsor of so-and-so channel that's pitting Hindus and Muslims against each other night after night. So you have to take a stand. Obviously, viewers have to take a stand and consciously say that we're not going to to watch this. But that's that's a much bigger debate. Uh, but, you know, that that's the fundamental problem. And uh, I, I don't see it actually improving. That's what's scaring me. Uh, I think there are some digital platforms, Milan, that provide some hope uh, in TV, yes, NDTV, one or two newspapers. Uh, lots of independent journalists have sort of emerged over the last couple of years, people who are doing their own thing now, doing good journalism. They're online. And uh, more power to them. They're really emerging as the future. So uh, let's come to the issue of the viewers. Um, you know, I recall a conversation I had, it's probably five or six years ago, with a relatively big name in the Indian TV industry. And I sort of asked him, you know, you have this constant shouting with like 10 or 12 guests every night, right? You can see their little postcards on the screen. And at the end of the 60-minute program or the 30-minute program, you you come away with almost nothing, right? You almost feel like dumber than you, than you began the conversation with. And why do you persist is what I asked him. And his response is pretty simple, which is that people tune in, right? Like it, the business model is good for us because we're getting amazing ratings. So isn't there some truth to the critique that, look, if viewers weren't watching this, the model would change. But the fact of the matter is, Viewers are watching these channels just as they are in the United States. They are watching Fox News. And so Fox News has zero incentive to do anything other than what it's doing now. That's absolutely right. I mean, I'm saying that until until viewers take a stand and decide that they're not going to watch this anymore, that's that's a that's a much bigger battle. But that doesn't mean that uh, as journalists and editors, we absolve ourselves of a certain responsibility as well uh, to, to, to the society that we serve. I mean, people want to watch porn. Is that what you want to show them night after night? You know, you take a decision that you're not going to show pornography uh, on air, but pe people may tune in and watch that. So, you know, what what is your responsibility as a journalist in terms of what you're broadcasting? You We can't just hide behind ratings and say that it's good for the ratings because then there is no there is no morality, no ethics, no... We, then our conscience is dead. You know, our responsibility as journalists is dead. 
so we we have to find a sort of a, a balance between what what people we think what they want to see what they're tuning in to see and you can I, i'm not against tv debates i've done them for 20 years i can't turn around today and say that this is a, a format that doesn't work because i actually believe it's it is a good format if it's done well if you are able to have a constructive conversation it may not lead to india pakistan peace i mean hell that 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 will take lifetimes but if you're able to have a constructive conversation with good panelists it it it's done on on issues that matter i mean a million this country never spoke about you know the women's sexuality or sexual crimes or violence against women until television took it up in a big way after the december 2016 gang rape of of a, of a young woman in delhi so there are issues that we can really shine a light on and we can and, and people tuned in then it wasn't a uh, i mean we had great ratings too but we didn't have these conversations saying let's you know hang hang everybody we had constructive conversations on how the laws can change how they need to be implemented what the ju- judiciary needs to do so there is a good smart way to do this but we can't keep hiding behind ratings and saying well this is what the people want so let's just do it like i said people want to see porn is that what you're going to put on air so we've been focusing right now on the sort of pushback that comes from from the right uh from the BJP but isn't there uh pushback that's also coming from the left of a different kind so i'll tell you about a personal experience that i just had where i moderated a debate put on by harvard your now university um students at harvard on electoral bonds uh and the government's claim that they have ushered in a new era of transparency and the debate featured two um uh, MPs or one MP uh uh Rajat Rajiv Gowda or ex MP and Jay Panda the national spokesperson for the BJP and i got um quite a lot of vitriol on my twitter timeline saying how can you possibly legitimize what the government is doing it's so clearly not about transparency and you know my my response was at the end of the day electoral bonds are the law of the land and if you want to change people's views you have to hear their arguments and you have to expose them and you have to debate them right and you have to show the other side but a lot of people just fundamentally disagreed that you should be doing that so do you think that um you know there are all of these conversations about sort of cancel culture and so on and so forth that the left is also responsible uh, to a certain extent I think it is and uh I mean did, did they have an objection to Jay Panda being part of your discussion I mean is it that you shouldn't have spoken to him at all I didn't understand what the objection was The objection was really that uh not about Jay coming on it was how can you pretend that there are two sides to this debate um it's so obvious that electoral bonds are a bad thing for transparency which by the way is a thing that i believe and have, have written about extensively however my pushback was um this is what governs election finance in india now right and so they have a view and the only way that you can take it on is if you actually have a debate with them otherwise you're just going to speak to the already converted absolutely and i and i agree with that that's why i said i said i don't believe in cancel culture and i've seen that's happened to me very often you know we at ndtv would get emails and letters and tweets from people from from the left of center uh who would say well why do you call rss uh, representatives on ndtv my argument to that was because they're ruling the country you you may not uh, agree with their ideology and you 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 may not subscribe to it but whether you like it or not uh you know they are an unelected organization that runs this country and that's a, that, that's the truth so we need to know uh what they think we need to confront them on certain issues there are certain stories i i genuinely believe milan that don't have two sides to it and i'll tell you some of them for instance lynching uh, which has been a big uh, issue in india over the last few years you know mob lynching etc uh, and, and some of these debates then are uh, sort of framed in absurd ways i mean like i'm not i'm not literally saying that this happened but i wouldn't be surprised if some channel had a debate was this lynching justified i mean that's the kind of absurdity we've come to so yes obviously it's not so to me those are stories that do not have another side but unfortunately you're right um there is a, a, an intolerance in in the sort of left liberal uh, uh, those who subscribe to that ideology to uh, and 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 they try to put pressure on you if if you know you have a a nuanced view on something and there is no room for nuance anymore and it's not just on social media you see that everywhere now i think you and i grew up 
uh, or I certainly did uh, in, in an era where there was scope to have a discussion and disagreement civilly, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, confront a different point of view with, with counterfacts. Uh, but that space seems to have completely shrunk. But I'm not going to change who I am because X side or Y side thinks I should say something. I am who I am. Deal with it. And I think many of us have to push back on that. I want to ask you about this issue of self-censorship. The Media Critic 79 and had an excellent 2019 essay that we'll link to on the state of the media landscape. And one of the things she argues in that piece is that, you know, one of the biggest problems facing the media is not censorship by the government per se, but really self-censorship on the part of the media. Uh, And she says that, you know, more than any time in the past that she can recall, media houses in India, this includes TV, print, and online, have discovered, as she puts it, the virtues of self-censorship. Now, of course, much of this is not going to be visible to the average consumer, right? Because it's like the dog that didn't bark. How much of a problem do you think self-censorship has become in newsrooms? And do you think it's increased in recent years? It has. And uh, and Sevati Nainan is absolutely right, because you do see that there are a number of newsrooms now that are, if you can still call them newsrooms, uh, that are reluctant to, say, uh, put out any hard-hitting critique of the prime minister or the home minister or certain government policies. And it's it is self-censorship. It, it's also because, I mean, to be honest, you know, one hears stories about newsrooms getting phone calls about why, you know, s- certain news stories were broadcast or why certain interviews were broadcast, etc. So we've seen that churning in the media. And yes, uh, the, you know, th- there is that self-censorship and it has gone up uh, in, in the last few years. There, there is no question about that. There are no false equivalences here. And every time, you know, for God's sake, this, this other word that I, that I discovered in the last few years, what about tree? Every time someone, you know, re, you know, comes and throws Indira Gandhi's emergency and what she did to the press uh, at us, uh, well, that, that wasn't exactly a shining moment in India's democracy. Let's not repeat that. Let's not emulate that. She, that we, we don't want 1975 again. So, I actually think a large section of the media today ha- is, is, has sort of capitulated in a way that even from, from what I hear from my father didn't happen even during the emergency. The, the way they are sort of pandering and, and uh, sort of just printing, even printing, and, and, and newspapers are not absorbed of this, just putting out the spin that the government gives without any questions. And at a time, Milan, when we have this pandemic, Uh, India is going to become very soon the country with the highest number of cases in the world. That should scare us. We have a very serious standoff at the border with China. And India's news channels are obsessed with the tragic death of an actor and an actress who has made that death about herself. I mean, about herself. I, I, it, it's just incredulous that this can happen. I, I'm not even going to ask you about the Sushant Singh Rajput thing because I feel like I was off social media for like five hours and I now have no idea where this story <laughs> has gone and I actually don't want to know. Um, but let's move maybe to some happier territory. You know, just going back to the self censorship thing for a second, I remember talking with an economic journalist, a TV journalist, um, who got a call the day that Arvind Subramaniam, the former chief economic advisor, came out with a paper arguing that India's GDP statistics were two and a half percentage points lower than what the government reported. You remember that day, it, it made a, a big splash. And the call was for this news channel not to lead their primetime coverage with that story. And uh, this journalist pushed back, and it did, in fact, lead. So there are stories also of people not succumbing, not caving in, uh, which which sort of leads me to my next question, which is, you know, what are the bright spots? Uh, Priya Ramani has, a, I thought, a really interesting column in Bloomberg Quint this week, uh, which was titled Your Guide to Loving Indian Media Again, which is a great title. Uh, in, in it, she says, look, there is a new crop of journalists using largely digital, but not exclusively, to reinvigorate independent journalism. So whether it's Barkad Dutt's, you know, magnificent reporting on the migrant crisis, Nitin Sethi has something called the Reporters Collective, which is a new entity. There's a site, Article 14, which focuses on justice and the rule of law. Um, so many more I could mention. Do you think that independent media is actually now fighting back and, and maybe striking some victories? 
I do. And that, that's why I mentioned them earlier as well, that the, these are the only sort of bright sparks apart from a f- very few in the mainstream media that uh, that that stand out. And, you know, the only thing I do disagree with is is those who say that, for instance, mainstream media in India is dead or television uh, news in India is dead. It's not dead. If you look at the ratings of just television news since the pandemic and the lockdown in March in India, uh, viewership has soared. So the medium is in suffering. Uh, the, the ratings have been extraordinarily high. Journalism may be dead, but you know the, the medium isn't. So, and even even in in TV today, there are I mean, apart from NDTV, there are a handful of reporters across some other channels that I saw who also did some really fantastic reporting on the pandemic, on the migrant crisis, and and brought those pictures home. And yes, uh, I mean, even Faith Isuza. Uh, who who now has her own independent YouTube channel. Now you have people like Faye, uh, it's, uh, uh, Summer Harlankar's Article 14, Nitin Sethi's work on electoral bonds has been outstanding. And yes, these people are pushing back. They're standing firm. It's not easy. It's not that, uh, you know, they're making tons of money off this. Uh, but But they are pushing back in a very, very difficult and hostile environment. And hats off to them. You know, one of the things that we've talked about a couple of times indirectly in this conversation is gender. And so I want to uh, focus there for a second and ask you what it's like to be a prominent woman in Indian journalism today, because they're kind of two different narratives I think you could spin. Uh, on the one hand, we have seen or we have heard really harrowing stories about the challenges that women have faced and continue to face and probably will continue to face in the future in newsrooms across the country. On the other hand, when you think about your specific expertise, which has largely been around foreign affairs, there is this amazing cohort of women um, whose names include people like Indrani Bhagji, Sohasini Haider, Smita Sharma. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and yourself, of course. What does the current landscape look like to you, right? I mean, because you have this kind of yin and yang. You know, my own uh, sort of take on this is very different simply because I always worked with only one organization and that's NDTV. And NDTV is an organization that's very much driven by women, uh, women editors, uh, women reporters, women camera persons. So uh, I honestly never felt that my gender was an issue when I was there because we were never assigned stories because uh, of our genders that, you know, you can't go here or you can't go to this conflict zone or, you know, X will go and Y will not. So in that sense, uh, we always had as, you know, equal opportunities as our colleagues. That doesn't mean that in other newsrooms it's the same because the stories from other newsrooms are often very, very different. So I think I've been very privileged to have worked in a newsroom like this. If you look at the NDTV primetime lineup till I was there, uh, you had you had me, you had uh, Sonia Singh, uh, Ankita, all of us doing primetime shows. Then you had Vishnu and Sanket also, um, and Vasu, of course. So uh, there would often be a joke that the men are outnumbered by women. And even in the editorial staff, you know, you had, um, again, you know, Sonia is the editorial director of NDTV, or Radhika Roy, uh, you know, along with Pranoy, Manika Raikwar, our managing editor. I was executive editor. So it, it was also... And Suparna Singh, of course, uh, our CEO at, at that time. So very, very driven by women. Uh, as far as other uh, journalists are concerned, you know, again, it's interesting. Even when I joined as a young political reporter, when I went to the BJP's, uh, when I was covering the BJP as a party or I was covering the Congress as a party, there are there are a lot of women pol- political journalists in India and who have always been there, who have actually sort of set the stage for the rest of us who are veterans in the field, and they're really, really good at what they do. And I think an extension of that then has been the the ministry that you named, the foreign ministry, where you again see uh, that some of the best people who uh, write today on foreign policy are women and and who report on it and who break news uh, on it. So I think in that way, uh, we've been pretty fortunate in India for a very long time, but there are battles that are a generation before us has fought for us. And we've. I think that's why the rest of us have been very lucky. Not to say, again, Milan, that things have been perfect and, you know, rosy for, for, for in other newsrooms. There are issues. There, there, there are those battles. But like I said, I come from a, I, I would admit, a very privileged bubble that way. So, Nidhi, you knew this was coming. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the U.S. election. Uh, 
how would you characterize the view from India on how the race is shaping up? Um, and are you surprised at how much attention India and in turn Indian Americans are getting? Because from my vantage point as an Indian American, this feels pretty unprecedented. I, I should ask you the question about the attention that it, that uh, Indian Americans are getting. But look, you know, this time there, there is a lot of interest in the U.S. election. There was even in 2016. Uh, but, you know, demonetization also happened on the same day. So we were kind of torn between both stories because we just saw our our earnings go up in flames. And then, you know, Trump elected as president. But it was, a, it was a tough call. No, but this time, you see, what's made this election more interesting is that, in a sense, even though they deny it now, the BJP-led government here, Mr. Modi's government, has clearly taken a position. And uh, and that is unprecedented in that there is this tacit support for Donald Trump. Now, they don't admit that now, but when Mr. Modi went to the U.S. last year and there was the whole Howdy Modi event in Texas, which Trump came for, and then, you know, Mr. Modi talked about Abki Bar Trump Sarkar, which was borrowing from his own election slogan, uh, that raised a lot of eyebrows because you've never had an Indian government take a political position on a U.S. election or any, you know, foreign country's election. But you don't think that was uttered in in jest uh, or you, you think there was an element of truth to it? I, I think prime ministers weigh their words or should weigh their words very carefully. It was clearly not in jest, but there was obviously a pushback on that because you had about a week later Foreign Minister Jay Shankar sort of backpedaling on that and saying that, no, no. This wasn't a political slogan. It was said in this context, that context, etc. But clearly, Donald Trump hasn't got the memo about it being a jest, right? Because his campaign videos are using the same Abki Bar Trump Sarkar, Mo, him and Mr. Modi holding hands very much. So he he is using that politically as well. So I think that's uh, raised a lot of interest here. I think a lot of people who uh, Indians who support the BJP and Mr. Modi find uh, a lot of uh, love for Mr. Trump. Um, and that's interesting because we, we you know that better than I do, that Indians in the U.S. have generally not voted for the Republican Party. Uh, but I don't know, I should ask you whether you see them shifting to Trump because of the Modi factor, because Mr. Modi is undoubtedly extremely popular, particularly among non-resident Indians. You know, I think uh, right now we just have one data point, which is the survey that came out this week, uh, the National Asian American Survey, which we'll link to, which shows that um, uh, compared to 2016, 28% um, uh, of Indian Americans compared to 16% four, four years ago are planning to vote for Donald Trump. Whereas the number for Joe Biden uh, and the Democrats has come down a little bit. Uh, I would take the numbers. I'll, I think they were done by a terrific team of social scientists with, with a grain of salt for a couple of reasons. One is that it's a relatively small sample size of 250 Indian Americans that were polled. The margin of error is quite large. It's plus or minus six percentage points. Uh, having said all of that, I would not be at all surprised if there is maybe a modest shift, not a 12-point swing, but something smaller, uh, not just because of the India Modi factor, but also because he's president, he's the incumbent, you know, the dynamics are different from, from, from 2016. Um, but, you know, if that's true, and I should just say in the interest of full transparency, um, uh, a team of us are doing a survey which uh, will come out uh, in mid-October with a larger sample size, just focus on Indian Americans. And the exciting thing about that is we are asking Indian Americans not just about how they view the United States, but also how they view India. So look forward to sharing that with you. We don't know what the numbers say yet. Um, uh, if the numbers that we've found so far hold, there's a really interesting potential dynamic going on, which is the politics of Vishwas, which we talk about in India, which is Neelan Sarkar's evocative phrase for why people have voted for Modi may have an international dimension to it, which is that whether you are pro or against Modi is not just now a domestic political matter in India, but has begun to shape the partisan attitudes of Indian Americans. Again, I don't think it's the determining factor. I think bread and butter issues will predominate, but it could be the sign of some kind of nascent shift. And, and, and the way to, to think about that, even in the absence of data, is to look at how anxious many Democrats have become uh, about the direction in which this community is going to go. 
exactly and look i i was just speaking to you without <clears throat> a survey in front of me anecdotally just you know the sense once one gets even while speaking to one's extended family in the us about you know where they stand on on trump versus biden and i think what you spoke about this whole this thing of about placing your trust in mr modi that's that's a very interesting factor that's playing out here because right now are uh, even though there have been a number of very questionable decisions that he has taken as prime minister he does not get affected by the criticism that follows from it in in a way i mean not just electorally but uh, and and we'll see that in bihar also May, maybe you know whether it's demonetization uh, whether it's the handling of the economy the pandemic he at least as per whatever surveys one looks at for what they're worth even in india um, is people still don't blame him for that directly even though he is the sole decision maker i mean nothing goes without mr modi's consent in this government so he remains extremely popular despite a host of questionable decisions and i think one of the things that we're seeing now is uh, you already had a personality cult around him but i think it's gone to the next level and i don't know whether his change in appearance lately with the longer beard and the longer hair has something to do with that and i'm serious because he is very very image conscious and of how his image is projected and i think he's coming across more like a uh, sage like like you know uh, th- there's a th- there's a certain image that's being projected of him being more sage like like the sort of father of the country who who the wise man who knows well who can guide us both as a prime minister spiritually emotionally i think a lot of indians actually do uh, you know in in a way look at him in some kind of divine light i'm i'm really not kidding i mean people people have written written about this so there are a lot of people who feel he just can't do wrong he can't do any wrong and that uh, but you have to trust him because ultimately he'll do the right thing for us that 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 is what is happening in india right now and the fact that you have a weak political opposition feeds into that because they're not able to effectively channel genuine anger people may have on say the handling of the economy uh, the lack of any sort of pack- packages really on the ground to help the poor and and the middle class after the pandemic etc so there may be anger on that but it's not modi's fault it's not mr modi's fault you know so that that's what's happening here it's, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out among indian americans also Yeah, I mean just another data point, you know, we've been involved in this multi-year study of uh kind of gender and social change urbanization in North India. So we've been four states and four cities we've been doing these surveys and uh, because of COVID we decided um we already are in touch with these households, let's do a phone survey and see how they're doing. Um so we did this just in Bihar and Jharkhand and the results hopefully will be out in the next couple of weeks but you know, one of the initial things that you see is when you ask people how do you rate the performance of the central government during this covid period i mean the 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 numbers are off the charts in both states across age groups across genders across other demographic categories so notwithstanding the fact that both bihar and jharkhand uh, in some ways bore of the brunt of a lot of the migrant crisis right i mean those are the places where a lot of migration is happening they obviously relatively poor states um they have weaker uh, health infrastructure and so on and so forth the central government and the usual politics uh usual meaning in most democratic societies you have this kind of you know politics of accountability doesn't seem to be uh to seem to be operative but let me just end with 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 one more question um and this is a question about kashmir but not kashmir what's happening in kashmir but more the international dimension you know i uh, recorded a conversation with ashley tellus um which will come out just before yours and, and you know this is something ashley has said in the past but he was even more forthright this time saying um do not underestimate the role that the abrogation of article 370 had on uh chinese motivations along the border um and i know that's a disputed narrative but it's something that he he strongly believes in uh one of the things you hear in this election uh I'm from Houston, Texas. It's a big uh uh has a big Indian American population. I talk to uh my friends' parents and so on and so forth. Um uh many people are raising Kashmir as saying the Democratic Party cannot be trusted when it comes to US India relations because uh 
whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Pramila Jaipal, whether it's the party itself, came out and questioned the abrogation and how it was done. Uh, are we underplaying to a certain extent the international ramifications of of what what happened in Kashmir? Um, you know, a, a lot of the focus of the reporting I've seen is really on what's happening domestically. Arguably, there hasn't been enough reporting on even that. But do you think there's something to this international story? Well, I have a I have a sort of new nuanced view on this because you still allow nuance when you're <laughs> Well, so this point. week, maybe not next week. <laughs> maybe not next week. See, there are a couple of things. Firstly, uh, the 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 ending of Jammu and Kashmir's special status was was a huge tectonic event, right? And uh, th- this is something that led to. To not just me, but in the whole, I mean, it led to the interna- internationalization of the Kashmir issue in a way that we had never seen before. Uh, Indian diplomats, the government have always been loath to uh, to have this issue internationalized, basically telling the world that it's none of your business, it's between India and Pakistan and, you know, uh, and so on. So one is that the issue got internationalized. India invited hand-picked diplomats to come and see things for themselves. And this was unprecedented. It had never happened before. What what uh, China is doing right now, I don't know whether it was just the abrogation of 370 or the, the dilution of 370 that has led to what they're doing on the borders. I think there is a very strong view, which I think I subscribe to, which is that given the sort of Chinese expansionist designs, the way the tra- trajectory that China was on in any case, uh, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if the Chinese had done this anyway. I don't think that some of the things that were said after the 370 move last year helped. It may have um, maybe added to that. But I wouldn't have been surprised if the Chinese had tried to do this anyway. There was a certain path that they were on. You could see that with the way that they're dealing with, with other powers as well. So uh, that's how I see that part of it. Um, as far as you know, this this view on Democrats and, and Kashmir is concerned. I think it's extremely unfortunate that uh, that there are, uh, I mean, that's, that's why Kashmir has become a sort of nationalist issue. And there's a danger when you see it only, you know, through, through a nationalist prism. Uh, because people like Kamala Harris or Pramila Jaipal were actually talking more about what India was doing in Kashmir in terms of the communication blackout, in terms of the mass detentions of people, including political leaders, uh, and 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 just just the sheer number of security forces, you still don't have full speed internet back in Jammu and Kashmir. Not just Kashmir, in Jammu as well, only a couple of districts, and it's been more than a year. You still have a, a lot of political leaders. You have a former chief minister, Mehbooba Mufti, who's still under detention under the law, and that should not be okay for any democracy. I say that as an Indian. I'm no. I I I say that as a Kashmiri that we should not be. We, we if we pride ourselves as the world's largest democracy, we cannot be okay with denying fundamental rights to our own people in Jammu and Kashmir. Whether it is the internet, whether it is uh, the the freedom to move, the freedom to speak. So uh, you know that 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 is something that I have seen over over the last year. That that sort of nationalist sentiment. That um, that the BJP has played on and and has been very touchy about. I think the reason why a lot of uh, prominent uh, people, not just in the US but in Europe, also in the EU as well, asked some tough questions of India's conduct is because you expect better from India. India is not Pakistan. India is not Saudi Arabia, and India is not China. So I think there are there are far greater expectations of us as the world's largest democracy. And, uh, you know, that's a separate podcast, Milan, that, you know, I, I could talk for hours on, 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 on the situation in, in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, but it has been internationalized like never before. That's a fact. And it has been internationalized by the government of India itself. The moment it invited foreign diplomats in uh, and, and uh, you know, foreign leaders to come in and, and supposedly see things for themselves, it opened the doors for international uh, com- commentary on this. I mean, I'll just say as a final comment, you know, I often get this pushback from some of my Indian friends um, that, you know, the, the U.S. shouldn't really be meddling or U.S. lawmakers shouldn't be meddling in India's domestic affairs, um, to which I often tell them, you know, 
there is no prohibition on the Indian civil society or frankly, even the Indian government um, raising concern and questions about uh, human rights abuses in the United States, uh, whether it's Guantanamo Bay or whether it's on the streets of major cities, um, uh, racial discrimination, violence, other things. And I frankly think you know, a, a, a democracy audit of the United States uh, w w would be a very useful thing. So I think, you know, um, uh, it's precisely, I think, friends um, who are able to kind of say these things to one another. Uh, but I think that, you know, in this polarized world we've been talking about often gets lost. Uh, my guest on the show today is Nidhi Razdan. She, for more than two decades, was a regular presence on NDTV until June 2020. She was the executive editor of the channel. She is now an associate professor of journalism at Harvard. Nidhi, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, I know that uh, everyone's life has been kind of turned upside down, uh, but we wish you all the best uh, in the coming semester. And hopefully you can get to Cambridge. And I look forward to, um, to meeting up in person. Thank you very much for having me on the show, Miller. Grantham Asha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting producing platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, granthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jonathan Kay. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Maya Krishna Rogers is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.